Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Foundations of Analytics Strategy. Our speakers are Sam Ransom, Associate Professor in Information Systems at Boston College and Guest Editor at MIT SMR. David Kieron, Executive Editor of MIT SMR's Big Ideas Initiative. And Pamela Kirk Prentice, Chief Research Officer at SAS Institute Incorporated. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three four business days after the end of the live event. In addition, today's slides will be available to attendees. We welcome your questions for our speakers today. And to submit questions, please enter them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag pound sign M-I-T-S-M-R-E event. If you are having audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead. And now let's begin. Sam, please go ahead. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, we'd like to first start by welcoming everyone for joining us. And on behalf of Pamela, David, myself, and a whole cadre of people, including Nina Krishwitz, Deb Galver, Helen Higgins, Mackenzie Wise, Lauren Rosano, uh, a ton of people all involved in creating this report and webinar, uh, we all thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, it looks like we have a truly stunning number of participants. Um, from our side, I can see uh, people constantly joining the webinar. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I need to stop looking at that because I'm likely to get distracted here. Um, with a large number of participants, it seems clear that this is an important topic with, with widespread interest. Um, and I know that with a large number of people, it can be frustrating how one-directional a webinar can be. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. While we can't hear your voice, we do want to hear from you, so let me emphasize this. Um, the point they just made about submitting your thoughts in real time using the webinar tool. We'd love to hear from you with any comments or questions or even disagreements. Uh, we've dedicated some time at the end of this webinar for just that, so please let us hear from you. We want to do what we can to make this valuable for you. So I'll start with an overview of our main findings from this year. Uh, David will then give some background of the overall research program and a bit of fun motivation. Pamela and David then will describe some of our findings in more depth, and then I'll come back with four specific recommendations. And we, we hope this will spark some thinking because we'll spend some time talking about your comments and questions at the end. So let's let's begin. And let's begin by underscoring the fundamental belief that we have that data and analytics can provide considerable value for organizations. There are two words that I'd like to emphasize in that statement, uh, can and value. So can implies potential, but not certainty. Value implies benefit, but not necessarily advantage. Both of these ideas infuse our research findings. In fact, this year we observed that competitive advantage from analytics is actually waning. Pamela will get into more details on this in a few minutes. In a few minutes, we'll go, um, actually, sorry, that, let me start with a quote from Steve Allen, who's the head of analytics for the Silicon Valley Bank. He summarized this waning quite well. He said, analytics can be used for competitive advantage, and it used to be that way, but now it's becoming table stakes. So analytics is pervasive. It's affecting practically every business, but competitive advantage from it is much more difficult. It's not endowed by just starting an analytics program or collecting more data or just talking about analytics. As analytics diffuses to an increasing number of businesses, it's become table stakes. Necessary, but not sufficient. And that's one important theme from this year's research. One might think with declining advantage, that it might be natural to assume that people would be getting disillusioned or uh, frustrated with analytics or some backlash of some sort, but nope. Despite the decline in the organization's reporting competitive advantage from analytics, considerable optimism remains. In a few minutes, David will describe the details behind this perhaps counterintuitive finding. A great example of this came from another interview uh, Angela Galkowski at uh, Intercontinental Health Hotels Group um, 
described her group's observations. Instead of pessimism, she described a huge appetite, not just for the analytics, but for our consultative help in resolving their problems. Similar thoughts echoed other interviews we did. People are finding value, seeing the potential, seeing potential for more value in the future. And what I like about her quote is it describes not just the appetite, but it portends the effort required to turn analytics into value. Her group works consultatively with others to surmount the difficulties that can arise in going from analytical results to business insights. That's an important other theme from this year's research. And finally, these analytical insights don't come easy. For me personally, every new year is filled with hope for the changes that a new year can bring. There's so much potential. But unfortunately, I live in Boston where the new year also brings snow and ice. And a New Year's resolution about something like more exercise is really easy to say. But for me, the harsh realities of my subarctic uh, conditions around me quickly dissolve the best laid plans of mice and men. More exercise is easy to say, but hard to do. Organizations can be the same. For example, General Mills is a large, successful organization. A change, such as adopting more analytical approaches, can be quite difficult. Wade Fleener, a senior manager of their Global Consumer Insights Group, describes General Mills as a huge ship. He observes it's very difficult to move, a lot of resistance. So there's a difference between a resolution and resolve. Success requires more than resolution, it requires resolve. That's an another important theme from this year's research, and we'll discuss these in more detail as organizations that we've seen gaining success from analytics demonstrate the resolve required to steer their huge ships that have lots of inertia. We'll talk about these themes today, and we hope we'll spark some thinking about how organizations can move beyond analytics hype through the often unobserved but important hard work behind analytics success. To begin, David will share with you some of the background of our study, how we did it, and then we'll go through some of the results of the research. I've noticed already there are a couple of questions about obtaining our report, and David will also describe where to download that from the MIT Sloan Management Review site. David? Thank you, Sam. So this data and analytics study is part of MIT Sloan Management Review's Big Ideas Initiative, which examines large-scale trends that are influencing the practice of management. Our data and analytics research program is one of our longest-running initiatives, and and it's been focused on, for the past six years on developing insights about how organizations are addressing the opportunities and challenges connected with data. From using new analytical techniques to finding and integrating new analytics talent to delivering on the promise of big data. When we first started this program in 2009, the term big data had far less cachet than it does today. But since we've been working with Pamela and SAS over the past four years, Interest in data and big data has increased by magnitudes. Indeed, when we first started our research partnership with SAS, if people were going to do an online search for big, they would be more likely to associate big with mouth than with data. And in this slide, you can see a Google Trends comparison of those two search terms. So people searched online for the phrase big mouth much more than they did for the term big data before 2012. You can see in this Google Trends chart that big data has become a much more popular search term than big mouth, even in this election cycle. That blue line represents searches on Google for big data indexed against all Google searches. Now, along with this dramatic increase in online searches for big data, companies across industries have also become more interested and invested in analytics. Our annual reports with SAS have documented this trend by compiling insights from executives and managers from around the globe. Over the years, we've tracked their ambitions with analytics, heard their frustrations, and tried to identify characteristics of organizations with effective analytics strategies. Each of these reports is based on survey responses from thousands of executives and managers and companies from around the world. We interviewed, and, and they these reports typically have interviews with more than a dozen executives. For this year's report, we surveyed 2,192 managers in, in a variety of industries. Our sample, as with past samples, was drawn primarily from MIT 
Sloan Management Review subscribers. We also interviewed more than 20 executives for this report, including executives from Ford, Intercontinental Hotels Group, Constellation Brands, Northwestern Mutual, CBS Interactive, Blue Cross Blue Shield, the VA Administration, and uh, uh, the Energy Management uh, Monitoring Company, Enernoc, among others. And, and with that, um, I'm going to turn the, uh, 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 the presentation over to Pamela, who will get more into the details of the research. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, depending on where you are, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope you're enjoying your, your holiday in style and uh, watching the NCAA tournament. So I'm going to go into the first finding that that, uh, that Sam talk, talked about and really a key component of the research that we found quite interesting. Uh, Sam mentioned right off the bat that competitive advantage from analytics is waning. And this is an interesting trend given that there is so much more data, as David showed, the, um, the increase in the uh, number of people who have searched for big data and, and uh, the same is true of analytics. So we, we look at this arch and we think um, – what is going on with this? Is, is analy analytics losing its luster? In 2010, we started out with just under 40% of the respondents to our survey indicating that competitive advantage helped them gain a competitive. I'm sorry, that, that analytics helped them gain a competitive advantage, and that increased dramatically in, in 2011 to uh, nearly 60%. And um, remember that in um, mid to late. In, in mid to late early 2000s, uh, Tom Davenport was coming out with his Competing on Analytics book. There was a lot of writing uh, about analytics and the potential of analytics. So that um, literature was just starting to kick up, and companies were really getting the idea that this notion of analytics might be a good thing. And then in 2000, 2011, of course, Moneyball came out and really sort of put the, the notion of analytics into everyone's household. In 2012, we saw our peak um, in terms of this competitive advantage at nearly 70%. And at that point, we started thinking, how high is up? Because at some point, uh, competitive advantage is not a competitive advantage anymore if everyone has it. So we knew there would be some leveling off at some point in the in the survey. And sure enough, in 2013, we see that 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 leveling off or that slight decline started to happen. And since then, 2014 and 2015, we have seen a uh, continued decline. So it wasn't an anomaly in 2013 when we saw that just slight, slight, slight tick down. So as we look at this, at this arc, we see that it, it in some ways mirrors uh, what you might call a life cycle or, or the Gartner hype cycle. And with that in mind, we started thinking about whether m analytics has actually lived up to its hype. Maybe companies are becoming disillusioned about analytics and the potential of analytics. It, it, analytics is hard work, as we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So um, to understand some of the things that were going on here, you know, we thought about w what are the conditions that um, would cause um, the, this decline in um, competitive advantage. So to summarize on this, the, the percentage of organizations gaining competitive advantage has declined significantly starting in, uh, really starting in 2012 and um, ending up at about 50%, still above where it was in 2010, but um, significantly down from its high level. So to understand this phenomenon, we, we asked uh, managers in our survey who indicated that they weren't getting a competitive advantage from analytics, what's up? Why aren't you getting this advantage? Um, and the, there was no real silver bullet explanation, nothing that you can say if you fix this, then that competitive advantage will return. Um, there were you know, a number of different answers here, as you can see on this slide, with the, the primary one being that a lot of companies have just started to use analytics, and they're really not seeing that return on, invest, return on investment yet. They haven't um, been able to, to wring the value um, out of it that would bring them competitive advantage. The second reason is that a lot of organizations are still sort of in the operational aspect of using, of using um, analytics. Um, they're not using analytics to drive strategic decisions. So there may be pockets of analytics in the organization where decisions are being made, but they're not at the level that would impact the organization's ability to compete in the marketplace or provide them with an advantage to do so. Another one is um, particularly important and interesting. We, we talked about this in our report last year called the Talent Dividend, and that is um, 
that a lot of organizations just aren't really sure how to apply the analytical insights to their businesses. This is a huge gap when we talk about bringing analytical talent in to an organization, um, hiring the, the data scientists right out of uh, their programs and putting them to work and giving them all the data that they need, but still not being able to take that data and turn it into something that's valuable to the business. So that's a, that's a skill gap that's extremely important. Another one is that um, analytics is not necessarily a priority for senior management. In many cases, particularly uh, organi uh, well-established organizations, um, the senior management is still quite reliant on their own experience and, and gut feel. And we'll talk a little bit about that balance of intuition and analytics um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, one thing that's also particularly important, um, it, although it only came up among about one in five respondents, is that companies are using analytics, but their competitors are using analytics as well. So um, it might be hard to gain an advantage if everyone is doing the same thing. And again, back to the reference about Moneyball, um, the, the Oakland A's had that competitive advantage by using the the analysis uh, for their team to put their team together, but then you know sports analytics became mainstream, and now many organizations are doing that, which puts the Oakland A's not necessarily at, in that uh, advantage position anymore. Uh, and then the, the final one was that a lot of organizations haven't really acted on the insights; they get the information, um, but but maybe it's not disseminated, maybe it's not um, built into their their operating plans. So in summary, um, many many organizations are not getting competitive from analytics because they are just beginning to apply analytics and need more experience. And then the the other aspects here of not using it to drive decisions, um, not knowing how to apply it, lack of senior management uh, support, competitive use, and not being uh, and not acting on the insights. Okay, so let's um, segue into a little bit of the why. Um, the Competitive advantage is not, um, from a data standpoint, not being achieved by organizations. And, and one thing I want to uh, uh, one thing one thing I want to report is that the individuals in the survey were not necessarily the same individuals. So when we talk about this decline in competitive advantage, we're not necessarily talking about declines in the same organization. Um, this is like a polling um, research where we're uh, serving a community of people and noticing the trends over time. So I wanted to make that clear that um, not necessarily the, the same companies. So let's talk about data. Uh, David mentioned the, the proliferation of big data and, and people searching for big data more so than big mouth. Um, and indeed, uh, the respondents in, in our survey are seeing increases in the amount of data that they get every year. And, and it has continued until this year. We saw just a slight decline, but seven out of ten over the past four years are seeing uh, an increase in access to useful data over the past year. And we don't see that uh, really declining much anytime soon. So with all this information, why are these organizations not able to, to get more insight out of it? Why are they not able to capitalize on it and um, you know, create that competitive advantage that Tom Davenport talked about? Well, there are you know, a number of reasons um, that, that play into that, and it's, it's, it's kind of like saying um, if I'm a very thin person I want to gain weight, I, uh, the more calories I eat, the more weight I lose, which of course would be really nice for a lot of us, but in this case we have the, the more data I get, the less insight I'm achieving from this. The, um, the rust-colored bar here shows actually a decline in the um, insights that organizations are getting out of their data. Uh, that helps them drive their strategy. So an inverse correlation between the amount of data they have and their ability to use that data to drive strategy. So while this access has increased, uh, the access to data has increased, the company's ability to use the insights has actually declined. So we need to figure out what it is behind that that the, the organizations can address. So let's look a little bit a little bit more tactically at the information value chain. Say we have all this information coming in, we have big data, we have the Internet of Things, we have all this stuff coming um, into the organization, but organizations uh, over the past four years are really not any more capable of dealing with it than they were back in 2012. 
So looking at this chart, we see that, for the most part, companies are pretty good at capturing data. You know, they have been on a big land grab. Whatever they can get, they, they bring in. It, um, at some point, it might be useful, and if it is, we're, we're going to bring it in and, and harness that. But there's a big gap between that and some of the other things that need to be accomplished in the information value, uh, uh, information value chain. Well, first of all, data integration is an issue. And we hear this a lot in other research where data management and data integration are really um, hindrances to effective analytics. If your data is not in order, you don't trust your data, then, of course, you're not going to trust the output. So there's some um, uh, some difficulty in aggregating and integrating information, and that is the, the green line there. And we see a little bit of an up and down there, but, but that skill kind of landed at the same level it was in 2012, as did capturing data. Now when we get to the strategic components of the information value chain, using insights to guide strategy, we actually see a decline from 2012, where it was about 55%, to 2015, where it's about 49%. So again, uh, organizations having uh, trouble with all this information, maybe they have the right skill set, but not applying the, the skill set to the appropriate uh, business decisions and not being able to guide strategy with those insights. And finally, uh, of particular interest is this low level of organizations' ability to disseminate data insights. Um, and this has actually declined quite a bit from about 46% to, to say, 41% over the past few years. So uh, the uh, the inability to to get the information out to parts of the organization that need that, that need it uh, is a huge barrier to uh, not obtaining a competitive advantage or not getting the data to to work accurately um for the organization. So just to recap again um we we see that decline in competitive advantage over time which in some ways would be expected as more companies use analytics um, and the, comp the, the competitive uh, portion of it kind of evens out. Analytics becomes table stakes. Um, we see more access to, to data, but less um, ability to drive that uh, insight into the organization. Um, and, and here we see um, bro uh, broken links in the value chain where organizations really have not improved at all since 2012 in doing some of the fundamental things that, that need to be done in order to make the data work for them. And now I'm going to turn it over. Next section. Thank you, Pamela. Um, this is David. So uh, we have found that over the years, uh, by grouping uh, respondents into different categories, different levels of analytical maturity, we've been able to tell uh, a more nuanced story about uh, how organizations are using uh, data. And we found that, um, uh, for the, so for the past four years, we've asked managers if their organizations are innovating with analytics and whether they are getting a competitive advantage from analytics. And so we use these responses to define uh, a group, groups of more advanced and less advanced analytically oriented uh, organizations. The least mature group we call the analytically challenged, and it's close to half of this year's sample. Um, uh, based on results from this year's and past year's survey, this, this group has a consistent set of characteristics in terms of the extent to which they use analytical insights in decision making, what they use analytics for, the quality of data they use, how well they manage and or interpret their data, and the kinds of analytical techniques they apply to their data. So the next, uh, the next more advanced uh, group, the analytical practitioners, uh, have a distinct set of characteristics. Uh, they use analytics in a broad range of operational applications. That's part of the reason why we call them practitioners. They're actively working to become more data-driven, and their data quality is good. In comparison to the challenge group, they have more of the information they need to make key decisions, key business decisions, and their analytics tend to be more sophisticated. The most advanced analytics-oriented uh, organization we call the, innovate, the analytical innovators. And these are respondents who uh, are in companies um, 
or these are respondents who agree most strongly with the statements that their organizations are using analytics to gain a competitive advantage and to innovate. Uh, and while this is the smallest group at 10%, um, uh, they, they also uh, have perhaps the most interesting uh, characteristics. Um, and they have, a, because in part, they have a very different orientation to data than either the challenge or practitioner groups. Innovators have an analytics culture. They use analytics to create strategy. They tend to treat data as a core asset. Their managers actually use analytical insights in a, in a, in a broad way across the organization, and they apply sophisticated analytics to their data. So culture, focus, data quality, talent, and complexity are like prime characteristics of uh, like the highest levels of analytical maturity. And, and right below that, uh, those blue words, uh, I should mention, is a uh, clear um, description of, 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 a, uh, of a URL that, that where you can go to get the uh, report. And that appears in virtually all of the slides that uh, you're seeing. Um, what we found is that over the years, the analytically challenged organizations have actually gotten uh, larger as a, as a group. Um, they, uh, and this re because of the way we've defined the maturity, maturity groups, uh, the recent decline in competitive advantage has had an obvious impact on the distribution of analytical maturity in our sample. As I just mentioned, the maturity groups are defined by how respondents, respondents answer the questions about their company's ability to get a competitive advantage and whether they're innovating with analytics. So there are now many more challenged organizations than in past years just because fewer organizations are seeing a competitive advantage from analytics. You can actually see the growth in the analytically challenged uh, category from last year in the fourth column to the right. This increase com comes almost entirely at the expense of the analytical practitioners, which used to be the dominant maturity group going back a couple years. The size of the analytical innovators has remained roughly the same, though in the past year declined slightly to about uh, 10%. Many of the reasons cited by Sam and Pamela for the drop in competitive advantage from analytics explains the growth of the analytically challenged category. Practitioners might have picked the low-hanging fruit and gained an early advantage, but when others did the same, their approach to data wasn't innovative enough to create a competitive advantage. We didn't see more erosion from the analytical innovators group because, well, in certain respects, that group did get smaller by about a sixth, but also because their approach to analytics is much more likely to be tied to their corporate strategy. It's hard to get a competitive advantage from, from a set of activities unless they're actually part of your strategy. Now, I don't want to underestimate the power of luck and circumstance, but competitive advantage, especially long-term competitive advantage, is a product of strategy. And if your analytic strategy isn't actually tied to your organization strategy, then you won't be as likely to get competitive advantage from your analytics. Another possible reason for the steady decline of the practitioner group is that earlier claims that they were gaining competitive advantage from analytics were simply inaccurate or exaggerations, products of hype the persistent and pervasive hype that has come to surround the promise of analytics. On this interpretation, analytical practitioners simply weren't getting a lasting advantage from analytics in the way that they had originally thought. In fact, the role of hype was a key area of interest for us in this year's study. How exactly has hype been influencing corporate attitudes toward analytics? Do executives have unrealistic or realistic expectations about analytics? How would how would uh, either of those attitudes influence the appetite for analytics? If competitive advantage from analytics continued to decrease, which it did, would that lead to disgruntlement with analytics? So this slide shows that, as, as Sam pointed out in, in his uh, review of the, our, our top findings, that optimism act about analytics is actually a much stronger sentiment than uh, pessimism. Um, corporate troubles gaining a competitive advantage from analytics haven't dampened enthusiasm for analytics. Uh, part of the reason for this optimism, we suspect, is that many companies realize that they are just beginning to appreciate what they can do with analytics. 
as Pamela noted earlier, or even with access to new data, or even with new access to old data they already have. Two of the organizations that we talked with, the Bank of England and the City of Amsterdam, found that they were able to have new discussions based on taking an inventory of the data sets they had. Such data inventories can be time-consuming work, but there are real benefits that come from knowing what data you have before you expand your efforts to derive benefit from them. As one executive mentioned to us, inventory sounds boring, but it's fundamental. We need to know what we've got to, what we've got to know how to manage it. Still, the survey results made us wonder, if you're not getting much competitive advantage from analytics and you're still optimistic about its potential, it's not exactly like the Who's in Whoville after the Grinch tried to steal Christmas, but it's not entirely different either. Why isn't there a commensurately high level of pessimism about analytics? We're now years into the hype around big data. Where's the disillusionment that Gartner's hype cycle predicts? Have managers just swallowed the hype around analytics and gone blissfully into the night? Well, if you look at the bottom half of the slide, we did find that a minority of respondents agreed that expectations around analytics weren't being matched by results, and that the results from analytics haven't really lived up to the hype. But again, optimism seems to be the stronger sentiment here, if you compare the green bars, which show levels of agreement with these statements. And we don't know if analytics hasn't lived up to the hype because the hype was hyperbolic to begin with, which hype tends to be sometimes. <laughs> the upshot from this slide and what we hear from interviews this year and in past years is that managers accept or have embraced that a data-driven world is their future, and they need to figure out what they're going to do about it. Their appetite and interest in analytics is independent of whether their company is getting a competitive advantage or not. Doug Laney, a Gartner analyst, overheard the following remark at a recent Gartner uh, uh, VI conference. He heard, if, if we don't evolve from being a bank to becoming an information company, we're dead in five years. We discussed in the report a case study about GE, which really took this kind of thinking to heart and made, and, the, and that company made a very large investment in becoming a digital company and creating a new business line around its Internet of Things services. When a traditional manufacturing company starts reinventing itself around data, that's strong evidence the world is tilting in a new direction. Which raises this question, is GE an outlier in its industry? In what industries are companies innovating with analytics? What industries are most likely to have companies reinventing themselves around data? And uh, we've had some questions about what the composition of our, our response pool is, and uh, uh, we we have respondents from a number of uh, a variety of industries a selection of which are presented here. Um, we also have uh, a, a broad uh, representation of different levels of management, from the, C from the boardroom to the C-suite, all the way down to uh, 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 coordinator uh, levels. Um, uh, and also a fair representation of folks from the uh, IT, from IT departments. This slide shows that um, uh, there's, there's a cluster of industries where they are innovating um, uh, with analytics. Uh, this, the, this is just about uh, innovation here. Um, IT, and, IT and technology, retail wholesale and services are at the very top. Um, and uh, uh, this can be explained by banks have made great inroads with fraud detection, retailers, better customer engagement and supply chain management, consulting groups. Well, consulting groups have really benefited from providing new analytic services to companies that haven't developed their own analytics capabilities yet. And in IT and tech, well, this is, this is a boom time for innovation in their sectors. Only two industries have a minority of companies innovating with analytics. These are healthcare, pharma, and biotech. Why these industry sectors? Well, there may be some uh, market dynamics at play. In pharma and biotech, innovation may occur over a longer time scale than some of the other industries. And in healthcare, it may be that innovation in a regulated environment that includes professional service providers like physicians uh, may be no easy matter. A prime example of that kind of difficulty is uh, the recent effort by many hospitals to roll out new electronic health record system. 
Okay, so that's a cross-industry view of innovation, but what if we compare this cross-industry view of innovation with a cross-industry view of competitive advantage from analytics? And what we find is, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into the, the details on this slide uh, because I want to make sure we get to the many questions that uh, have come through, um, but innovation and competitive advantage do not always go hand in hand uh, across industries. In some industries, uh, competitive advantage uh, is happening at a more frequent rate than the uh, extent to which uh, companies are getting a competitive advantage, uh, innovating with analytics. Um, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's all that I have to say for that slide. And uh, Sam's going to take over uh, to talk about the rest of the uh, insights that we've gotten from the report. All right, so Pam and David have discussed some of the current context around analytics and different analytical maturity. So based on this, what do we recommend? What, uh, what would we tell people listening to do? And I think we've got about, we have four recommendations that we'll go through here. And the first is around using analytics throughout the organization. So we had some examples there, and David just went through different industries and showed some of the variety of ways that analytics is being used. But there's also a fair amount of variety within organizations. And so one of the things we asked was senior management. What, how much is analytics making a difference in, in their managerial decision making? And so we looked at C-level, senior management, and general management. And actually, I think more surprisingly is that we, we kind of expected that perhaps there would be less use of analytics at at higher levels, but we just don't observe that. Um, we do see a much greater use of analytics throughout organizations that are analytical innovators, but not so much variation across the different managerial levels. <clears throat> um, so I think one of our, our the recommendation we would make from this is that the successful strategies affect decisions at all levels. It's not restricted to purely operational levels or purely strategic levels. Our second recommendation was around the idea of analytics versus intuition. So there's a lot made about the battle between these two. Is it the, the John Henry fighting the, the machine? And so we specifically ask organizations, how well do you blend analytics and intuition? And you can see, you know, it's a relatively busy chart, but I want to point out a few things. Um, across the board, our, our rust-colored diamond, which is the analytical innovator, is always further to right than the analytically challenged or analytical uh, practitioners. So it's across the board, that's true. Um, one of our quotes from our sur one of our surveys, uh, I'm sorry, one of our interviews, was that intuition versus data is a false dichotomy. It's Great analytical teams love intuitive thinkers who love data because the two things work well together. The idea of positioning them as a counter to each other or substitutes doesn't really work. They're complementary. The other point that I'd like to point out is how much difference there is between the dots in some areas. So in some dots, they're relatively close together, but on some measures, the dots are relatively far apart. So if you look at something like reducing cost, there's a very high absolute level of analytical use across all three. But if you go down one, two, three, four, five to establishing strategic objectives, there's a much greater dispersion around how wide those are, the distance between the analytical innovators and the analytically uh, challenged. <clears throat> we think that that's important. So this spread, actually, we decided to explore a little more and our, come to our third recommendation, which is around making a change or towards planning to apply analytics to strategy. At an aggregate level, our innovators are far more likely to use analytics in strategic versus operational ways. <clears throat> One of the things we explored was the idea that it may make a difference what the strategic focus of your company is. 
if your company is focused on diff cost leadership and trying to get the cheapest uh, possible products, then perhaps analytics is more useful. But what we found was a few differences. Uh, if I look at those different charts about the different uh, corporate strategies, I don't see much difference between how the innovators, practitioners, and challenge organizations spread across industries. Certainly there are small differences, but n nothing that I would see as dramatic. What we did see a dramatic difference in was a long-term plan for analytics. People who are analytical innovators are far, far more likely to have a formal long-term strategic plan for analytics. This was a, a, a big finding, and we think that strategic focus is the next area for analytical application. Our fourth recommendation is around exploring new options with analytics. We asked quite, uh, the participants uh, about their spirit of discovery. How, how much do they try to do new things with analytics versus old things? Now, it's not necessarily bad to do old things. There's an inherent trade-off between incremental improvement and exploratory improvement, and both are important. But what we find is that Analytical innovators don't restrict themselves to trying to use analytics to make incremental improvements. They're not necessarily just trying to climb the local hill. They're trying to find a bigger hill to climb. One of the, one of the detailed ways that we looked at this was around their use of a big data initiative. And what we found across the board was that analytical innovators are far ahead in terms of time uh, and how well they embrace new ideas, and, and big data is a good example of that, that they're far further along, much more green in that chart for analytical innovators than for the, uh, the other groups. So it's about embracing new things. And you can't just embrace new things without um, planning to eviscerate someone when they make a mistake. Uh, that, that will guarantee you no exploration. And the GE case, that uh, David alluded to just a minute ago provides some good examples of that. There's a ton of piloting and testing that goes on. And I'm sure they make a bunch of failures, but they're small failures and they're bounded failures. It's a really easy way to keep from making a massively, potentially devastating big mistake. So we distill these findings into four recommendations that, that we think uh, work. And I know that we probably have started more questions than we have actually answered today. If, if the list of questions that I can't even really process is so long, um, I know that we've got a lot of questions here. And hopefully while I've been talking about these recommendations, David, I hope, has been trying to read through all these questions and comments and find some good ones for us to talk about. Uh, and, I never know exactly what criteria David will use in picking questions, so this is a little bit of a rolling the dice for me too. Uh, David, have you have you found some fun questions to to from the from the group to, for us to talk about? Sam, it's very important to keep the mystery going with you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I just want to say that that uh, concludes the presentation portion of our program today. Uh, we are going to move into uh, our Q&A. I have been uh, uh, identifying, uh, selecting uh, from among the many, many, many questions that have come through. Um, uh, we've gotten lots of great questions, and we'll continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. Uh, and a reminder that you can submit your questions by entering them into the chat box in the lower left corner of the webinar screen or on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, hashtag MITSMR. Event. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the the first question um, that uh, that has come up um, uh, that uh, we should make sure we address is: Did your study cover countries outside of the USA? Um, uh, Sam, uh, one, could you could you? Yeah, that? actually, we are we are certainly not focused entirely on the on the US. Uh, we've we have, uh, obviously, we are in the U.S., but uh, there are many of our respondents are outside the U.S. Many of our interviews are with non-U.S.-based companies, so we very much tried to make this a non-U.S.-focused report. Bank of England is a good example. 
uh, city of Amsterdam, show me. There's lots of examples in our in our interviews. Okay, another question has come in about uh, competitive advantage. We've talked a lot about competitive advantage uh, in this. Uh, webinar and it's, and it's in the report and it's in uh, our, our series of reports. Um, uh, a few uh, participants uh, would like to know more about, you know, how we're using competitive advantage, um, uh, what that means. Um, Pamela, would you like to take that question? Okay, sure. So it sounds like the um, author of the question is asking what definition are we using of competitive advantage? And if that's the case, I would say that we're actually leaving that definition up to the participants in the research. Uh, the question, uh, quite simply, is uh, does analytics help your organization? Um, what is it? <laughs> I knew what it was. Uh, does, your, so, uh, does analytics help your organization achieve a competitive advantage? So um, we're not putting any parameters around uh, the definition. Um, but in terms of what, what we're talking about and what we look at um, when we're uh, analyzing the data and uh, preparing our findings is you know, the traditional element of competitive advantage uh, being anchored in you know, Porter's uh, five forces where um, a company um, achieving that advantage is you know, one of pursuing one of three strategies. And those are the ones that Sam talked about, the uh, market focus, differentiation, and, and low-cost leader. And that um, that advantage is obtained through, um, in, in our case, um, lo looking at uh, looking at data and, and doing the analytical work behind that to try to uh, differentiate themselves from the, the competition. So that I think that was a very long-winded explanation of saying that we're letting the respondents um, define competitive advantage, but in terms of our report, we're thinking about that term in the broader sense. Okay. Uh, another question has come in about uh, upskilling managers to, so that they're better able to use uh, analytics. Um, Sam, would you like to take that? Sure. I guess as the as the as the educator in the in the audience, I should I should uh, take that. Uh, at our universities, upskilling is is really about what we're what we're about. And one of the there, I think there's a lot to this, but let me just harp on one thing so we can get to more questions. And I, I want to harp on practice. I just don't believe people are born with knowledge about how to use Hadoop. It's, it's not it's not in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and in early early development stages knowing these technical things. It comes from practice. And so, you know, at universities, what we do is we try to motivate through examples. We try to distill to core skills and practice those skills. Um, organizations can do the same. Uh, their practice can come from doing small examples. Um, it can come from kind of a carrot and a stick approach. I think of maybe a little tiny stick, not a big stick. So requiring people to actually use analytics uh, in in their decision making, but also incentivizing and rewarding it. So I think I would harp on practice. Okay. Uh, uh, next next uh, question uh, also connects with um, uh, the healthcare industry. Why is the healthcare industry behind on the use of uh, data in terms of innovation? Um, I, I spoke to that a little bit. Um, Sam, Pamela, do, do either of you have anything to add about uh, that specific industry and sort of where they're at uh, with with analytics and what uh, where the opportunity is for them to do more? Um, I'll, I'll take that um, and just comment on it briefly. The healthcare industry is um, one of the industries that has tremendous complexity in data and vast amounts of data. Um, we have all the patient information. We have outcome information, um, the, the drug uh, development information, and it's disparate across hospitals and providers and um, entities. So uh, there isn't really one common core of information where the healthcare industry can tap into that data and make, you know, recommendations or um, drive insights. So these clumps of providers, if you will, hospital organizations, 
um, are really struggling with uh, a number of issues. One is the amount of data they have, and the second one is the whole notion of privacy. So when information is shared, um, hospitals have to follow certain guidelines. And so I think these restrictions are really kind of putting a little bit of a damper on the potential of analytics within healthcare. Um, there's, there is tremendous uh, potential because of the information that's available, but there's reluctance to share and there's some reluctance, you know, to, to violate the, the privacy of patients. I can also, can yeah. I jump in with something too? I don't know if that's fair or allowed in the r rules of engagement and the questions, you, but uh, you may, you <laughs> may, Sam. Uh, I think quickly, health, quickly. Healthcare is particularly fascinating, and there are a couple of case studies on our on our website around uh, WellPoint and Intermountain Healthcare that. That address that, but I also I think that there's a certain amount of grass is greener. So people in one industry know all the difficulties that are within their industry, but then assume other industries are better somehow or easier. Uh, I know I assume everyone has their life easier than I do, but I, deep down I know it's not true. And so I think every industry has its particular challenge, and it's just a matter of figuring out what that challenge is and applying applying the strategy to it. Now, having said that, healthcare does seem to have its, its, its share of challenges. Okay, that's great. Uh, let, let's move on, move on to another question. Uh, this question connects with uh, talent. What is the role of talent in an analytically mature organization? Um, uh, instead of just referring the questioner to uh, last year's talent dividend uh, report, which we should do, um, uh, uh, what, what can be said about analytical innovators and uh, uh, sort of uh, differences around the talent that they have that other organizations, other maturity groups um, may not? Um, well, one of the key findings from last year, David, is, as you remember, um, is that the analytical innovator companies uh, do a much better job at hiring and keeping the um, analytical talent that they need. So it's, it's sort of a little bit of a catch-22 for those companies that don't have the talent and are struggling to um, move up their position on the hierarchy, if you will, of analytical maturity. Um, data scientists, particularly, you know, that's that's the job of the 21st century, the, the, the sexiest job, um, are in, in short supply compared to the amount of demand there is. So the most attractive companies, whether they are organizations who have analytics as a fabric of their existence, you know, companies like Google or Facebook that actually started, you know, from the digital point in time and didn't have to go through that big transition of, of applying analytics. Um, so there's there's a big challenge in those lower two levels, the analytical um, analytically challenged and analytical practitioners to to compete for that type of talent. I think that's one of the um one of the key findings from that talent dividend study was that it really stood out that the the analytical innovators are much more likely to have the ta much more likely to say that they have the the appropriate talent for their analytical strategy. Yeah, and I would I would add that uh another one of the findings from from that report uh, uh is that organizations that are successful with acquiring talent actually have a plan for obtaining the talent, integrating the talent into the organization, and uh, coming up with some kind of uh, retention plan uh, to, to keep them on. Um, and, and there are different ways of, of acquiring or gaining access to analytics talent. One is, one is by uh, straight hiring, another is uh, 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 renting uh, through the services um, sector uh, analytics talent. Um, I think to add something, a mini point to that, that we'll also, I think, see maturity around that. As analytics matures, we're going to have to, we're going to be able to move from needing these jack of all trades types of people and get increasing specialization, increasing role definition. That's happened in every industry. We don't ask people to be both architects and builders. Uh, and so as, as we go forward and mature, I think that there will be better definitions around talent, and we won't need those those unique people who can do everything for everyone all the time. Yeah, the <clears throat> there's uh, just a little bit more time left. Uh, there is um, 
this question uh, that uh, I think is a very important question and uh, gets at a number of different issues that we've talked about today is how does analytics adoption vary across function in, uh, in the organization? Are some functions ahead of others? <laughs> so, so, all right. So, David, uh, uh, <laughs> David is a question answer. Darren Asker never has to answer a question. <laughs> okay, I, I uh, can go to that one. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I'm, I'm ready to go. I am ready okay. to go. You're, you're on then. No, <coughs> no, I thought you just said you were going to take it. Um, so, <laughs> you know, one of the when uh, the first paper that we did with uh, SAS was called uh, From Value to Vision, Reimagining the Possible with uh, Analytics. And that was, a, that was a report we introduced this uh, uh, tripartite um, uh, division between maturity groups. And, uh, you know, we were talking about organizations uh, okay. as falling into these different categories. And that's how, and that's how the questions, uh, that's how we defined these groups. Um, but uh, a, an executive from uh, a large commercial construction company uh, contacted us after after that report came out, and he said, "You know, within our organization, there are uh, there are some business divisions that are uh, uh, more like innovators, and there are other business divisions that are more like um, uh, challenged uh, groups." and and then he, he also made that point about different uh, functions, and uh, that we we heard that um, uh, in in that instance. And there was another story about a, a professional baseball team um, uh, manager that we interviewed, and he was uh, he was in a marketing function, and he and he was complaining and uh, wistful almost. So it's like the people who are running. The hiring of, uh, you know, who are direct, who are, who are in the analytics part of the organization that are working with, uh, players and figuring out who we should, who we should hire, what things need to be worked on. They get all of the resources. And I'm here trying to sell concessions and there are all kinds of, uh, analytic tools and, uh, investments that I'd like to make. And we get very little in, in comparison. So there is a great variety, uh, 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 in analytics adoption across organizations, um, and some of that has to do with leadership interests. Some of that has to do with, uh, you know, corporate strategy. Some of that has to do with uh, the alleged, you know, democratization of of data, where you basically uh, put put bids in on projects, and uh, it has to do with the value of those those projects to an organization. And if your organization, if you're part of the organization, your function doesn't actually uh, isn't coming up with um, analytics projects that uh, you know uh, warrant certain kinds of investment. You don't you don't get the, the the analytics. So there are a lot of factors in play that influence the uh, com uh, complexion of uh, analytics adoption across market functions across functions in an organization. So that is that concludes the uh, uh, this portion of our program. Uh, a reminder that a recording of this program and the presentation slides will be available within three to four business days. Thank you for attending our program today. Um, uh, really appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, your questions were great, and um, uh, we really enjoyed um, uh, presenting this this content that we worked uh, hard on for uh, a long period of time, and I think we came up with some uh, uh, valuable insights that we hope you, too, uh, believe to be valuable. Thank you.